Chapter 1 The Latecomer Tom Lewis Tom Lewis, a retired Army colonel, is one of Hollywood's best-known film producers. His list of credits in Who's Who in America covers as much space as did the ribbons on his chest. He was the founding producer of the Screen Guild Theater, the founder of the American Forces Radio and Television Service, of which he served as commandant throughout World War II, and the creator and executive producer of The Loretta Young Show. A regent of Loyal Hannah University, he holds numerous awards for excellence in television productions, both at home and for the American forces throughout the world. A devout Roman Catholic, he is now numbered in that rapidly growing group who call themselves Catholic Pentecostals. Last winter, my son, a young film director and a producer of his own age, were contemplating a TV special on the Jesus People. I agreed to their request to write the presentation, but reluctantly. Since the Jesus kids were all so young, I thought my son and his associate should staff the whole project accordingly. My preliminary research on the young people I was trying to learn about generated my interest and respect. Many of them had come back from the hell of drug addiction by way of a reborn faith in Jesus Christ. At this point, I had not probed into the religious motivation of the movement. On the human side, however, I could not help but be impressed with the Jesus kid's sincerity, as I was startled and puzzled by their familiar manner of speaking about Jesus, as if he were right there with them. I had always thought of myself as a reasonably religious man, who enjoyed the sacramental life of the Roman Catholic Church. I didn't go around referring to Jesus Christ as if I met with him frequently and personally. As a matter of fact, I seldom mentioned Jesus by name. I thought it better taste to shun a more personal approach and preferred the more reserved reference, my Lord or the good Lord. As a part of my task, I was asked to look into the ministry of Catherine Kuhlman a person highly thought of by the Jesus people. Miss Kuhlman came to the Los Angeles Shrine Auditorium once a month for a miracle service. I asked for two seats in the center row on the aisle near the front. It appeared, however, that this was not how tickets were obtained. One waited in line and took his chances. The capacity of the Shrine Auditorium is 7,500 people, and I was told sometimes twice that many tried to get in. I was amazed, and my amazement didn't wear out for four or five months. I fear because it took me that long to drive down there and get in line. The day I did so was unseasonably warm for March, even for sunny California. I turned off the freeway at Hoover Street to gauge the traffic situation around the auditorium. Normally, that downtown area would be all but deserted on Sunday, but as I approached the shrine, Every parking space on the street and in the huge lots appeared to be taken. Bus after bus drove up to the main entrance to discharge its passengers. Some buses were marked Charter, and others bore the name of their point of origin. I remember one marked Santa Barbara, another Las Vegas. To my astonishment, one travel soil bus read Portland, Oregon. Quite a little trip, just to attend a Catherine Kuhlman miracle service. I was wondering what Miss Kuhlman gave away in there. It couldn't be dishes. There were too many people. Nor could it be bingo. How could one manage 7,500 bingo cards? A long line of wheelchair patients was moving along Jefferson Street toward a side entrance to gain immediate admittance. So, too, did many men and women carrying hymn books, choir members, apparently, There were also many Roman-collared men and somberly dressed women, and I wondered what the priests and nuns were doing there. I found a gas station where I parked my car, and then joined the thousands waiting at the main entrance of the shrine. My watch showed 11 o'clock. The doors were to open at 1. Normally, I wouldn't wait that long for anything, including the second coming, but that proved to be a rash reflection. More and more people piled in back of me, and I found myself near the center of a huge crowd. This gave me a slight feeling of claustrophobia, so I concentrated on taking mental notes, from which I could construct my presentation. 
big crowd, orderly, quite a few young in the category of the Jesus kids. These young people tended to stick together, forming islands in a sea of bodies. They sang while waiting, not loudly, not necessarily for others, not even acting too aware of one another. They sang in a rather quiet, meditative way. I thought it unusual and peculiar. It reminded me of a group of Coptic Christians I once had seen in Rome, praying audibly, yet not in unison, independent of each other, yet together. Now, the crowd had grown very large indeed, and someone inside took pity on us. The doors opened some twenty minutes before one o'clock. People in back of me surged forward, and I was carried past the closed box office. This surprised me because I had my hand on my wallet pocket, ready to pay for a ticket. The lady right behind me noticed it and laughed. Money won't get you nowhere here, she said, but if it burns a hole in your pocket, there will be a free will offering sometime later. That was the tone of this great crowd, orderly, not festive like a crowd at a ballpark, rather quiet, not very communicative with each other, although friendly if conversation was called for. I found a seat quite far back to the side on the first floor of the auditorium. The bright, harshly lit stage was full of activity. Men and women carrying hymnals were finding their places in a bleacher-like arrangement that filled the stage. Two concert grand pianos flanked the choir. There seemed to be hundreds in the choir, yet here too, as out front, there was no disorder, no confusion. Despite the constant movement due to late arrivals in the choir, Singing went on as in a silent cathedral. The conductor, a slight, aristocratic-looking, white-maned male, led the rehearsal with unquestioned authority. A lovely-looking older lady sat on my right. For all the attention she paid me, or the thousands around her, she could have been alone in the Lady Chapel of St. Patrick's Cathedral. She had an open Bible in her lap, and now and then she read from it silently. A Bible seemed standard equipment for many of those present. Two young men behind me carried them, but they weren't reading. They hummed or sang the words of the hymns being rehearsed on the stage. I didn't like that. I have never liked the audience participation type in theaters, concert halls, or movie houses, especially when the audience participation is not specifically solicited. But I was to hear more from these young men. Meanwhile, the harsh lights on the stage were dimmed and softened, and color was added to them. The many pastel colors in the street dresses of the women in the choir made a pleasing contrast to the blue, cycloramic curtains surrounding everything. The rehearsal phase was over, and the choir was singing in earnest now. Most of the hymns were old and familiar and well-loved. How Great Thou Art! Amazing Grace! The singers were excellent. Drawn, I learned later, from churches of every denomination through the Los Angeles Basin. Without pause, the choir went into, He Touched Me. I felt a taut air of expectancy take hold of the audience. A spotlight hovered over an area in the wings on the audience's right. The audience stood, and here and there people began to applaud. Miss Kuhlman, a slight and fragile figure in a lovely white dress, came on the stage, singing with the choir. She crossed to a beat-up-looking music rack, right of stage center, picked up from it a necklace microphone, which she fastened around her throat, and without pausing, led the people in several rousing and one chorus of, He Touched Me. Then, without a word of explanation, she followed with, He's the Savior of My Soul. The audience and Catherine Kuhlman seemed to agree that these hymns were special to her. Again, without explanation, she began to pray aloud. The audience stood, heads bowed, following her prayer silently. I knew right then what had been different about the singing of those islands of young people outside the auditorium. What was special about the singing of the large chorus up there on the stage? They were singing, yes, but they were singing plus. They were not performing. They were worshiping. And the people in the audience here were reacting with the difference. They weren't an audience at all. They were a congregation. They sang as one with the choir when they were moved to do so. They prayed as one with Miss Kuhlman. This wasn't a show. It was a prayer meeting. 
I don't know how I felt about this at that time. Impressed, probably, and pleased with myself that I have made an interesting discovery. I soon discovered something else, however, and it shocked me. Now and again, the young men behind me would give vent to loud amens and praise God. Seemingly, in response to a prayer or a statement, many throughout the house were doing the same thing. Many were holding up their arms in a supplication gesture that I related to the stance of those biblical figures one sees in stained glass windows. No telling what this will lead to, I thought, and looked around automatically for the nearest exit. One young man high up in the choir was particularly disturbing to me. His arms were lifted high most of the time. This must be the miracle of the miracle service, I thought. No circulatory system can withstand the strain of a posture like that for long. Those arms are going to fall right off. But I forgot him. I forgot them all. Like the lady beside me, I might have been in a remote chapel, alone, except for a presence one does not normally find in such a huge auditorium. Yes, that was it. There was a presence here. And that was why this crowd of many thousands was at times so silent, I could hear the sound of my own breathing. This was the reason for the order here, the consideration among so many people. That was why one lost track of time. There was something different here. There was love, specific and actual. Yes, and more than love, there was this presence. I remembered the words of a Jesus kid song. They will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. The healings began, two in the row quite near me. I saw them before they were called by Miss Coleman. I saw the amazement of those healed, then unbelief, their realization, and their happiness. There were many, many healings on the stage now. People left wheelchairs. A crippled nun walked who had not walked in years. I saw gratitude among those healed. Thanksgiving so palpable, one can almost reach out and touch it. Drug addicts were delivered, and by the evidence of transformed, incandescent faces, I saw interior rebirth and moral regenerations. I lost track of what I saw, for at some point unknown to me, I ceased to see and began to feel. I felt to the depths of whatever consciousness I possessed. I became aware that I was carrying on a conversation, the most astonishing, nakedly honest conversation of my life. I was talking to God. Somewhere within myself, I was telling God things I had never known before, or could not or would not admit. Against the evidence of my flesh, against the visible and apparent facts of my busy life, the love and companionship of my sons and their friends, my own many friends, my worldly interests, my hobbies, against that evidence, I was telling God that I was restless and lonely, deeply, desperately lonely, and not for people and not for things. I had those in abundance. I told God I was very empty. Next, I was taken over by the strongest emotion I have ever known, hunger, raw, stark, primeval hunger. I became aware that people were crowding the aisles now and filling the stage. Miss Coolman was inviting those who wanted Christ in their lives to step forward, acknowledge their sin, accept Jesus as their personal Savior, and surrender themselves utterly and irrevocably to Him. I followed them. I was among them. I, the non-audience participator, the self-made sophisticate, I was making my commitment and with the most awesome realization of the scope and responsibility of it. I ask God to keep me from fear of it. He has. That night, driving back alone to my little town of O.J., I wept. All the way back I wept. I felt neither happy nor sad. I felt cleansed. During the night, I woke with an instant and full realization of what had happened. I recommitted myself to Christ. Noted that I neither doubted nor feared my commitment and fell soundly and dreamlessly asleep. Late next morning, I walked into the little town of O.J. from my home in the country. I felt very well, rested, and at peace, the emotions of yesterday far behind me. I passed my parish church, a small Spanish colonial chapel on the main street. 
This was the season of Lent. The time was somewhere around 1130, and I knew there must be a Mass going on inside. There was. I was in time for the Eucharistic celebration that we commonly refer to as Holy Communion. I went to the altar automatically, and because there were only six or eight persons present, we received the Holy Eucharist in both species, bread and wine, instead of returning to the rear of the chapel. I knelt for convenience at the first pew. It was good that I did. What I had taken into my body was not bread and wine, not a symbol, not a memento. It was the body and blood of Christ, and the result in me was a most profound knowledge of the real presence of Christ. It was an experience of great and unspeakable joy, and my body shook violently with my effort to contain it. Jesus the Christ was there with me, and every cell of my body was witnessing to his reality. I rested my head on my arms, and time was suspended for me for a while. God lives. God truly lives. And he moves among us, and he breathes out his Holy Spirit upon us. And through the merit of the blood shed for us by his divine Son, he is preparing us for whatever lies ahead, in this troubled world and beyond. Praise God.